Um, okay. And really just kick in as we go along. I think just, uh, you know, interrupt or ask questions about your context as we go. And if anybody else joins us, they can do the same. So as I think you know, this is one of the, the series of um, webinars uh, exploring social leadership. And I run this series of 12 webinars about uh, once a year in an open session like this. And that really gives me a chance to build out from the, the work that was in the uh, social leadership handbook and just add in the, the um, most recent work and thinking about it. So the main difference this time round from when I last delivered this open session, which was actually April 2017, is that uh, I completed a quite large scale research project in the NHS actually around uh, communities. So I'll be drawing some of that uh, work in here just to reference some of the research as we go through. And I'm also um, building out from that uh, a community handbook, which is, I've got a draft of it together at the moment, but it's intended to take the foundation work on social leadership, so the work that was in the handbook, and then the two big research projects on communities and the landscape of trust, and put that together, and it explores 10 um, aspects of building and holding a community uh, together. So that's going to be uh, coming along, probably just as an ebook actually, but later, uh, later in this year. I was talking to someone earlier actually, and just thinking back to an article I, I wrote a while ago, which was called Spaces, Places and Communities. And um, the reason for that was that there's a big uh, learning technology conference in, in London this, uh, this week. And of course, technology can give us a space. So technology uh, creates spaces where we can come together. But of itself, technology doesn't give us a community. Um, a community is about a, a sense of place, you know, your, your home, where you live, where you grew up. Those are, are places, they're places with imbued meaning. Um, and so meaning is created by people and imbued onto spaces. And of course that happens within the arms of a community. So although there are lots of technologies that use the word community, and there are lots of formal organizations that talk about building communities, ultimately um, the power to build and hold a community sits with the community itself, it sits with people. So that's really what we're exploring in this area. The context of this then, in terms of social leadership is, the, the, uh, the social leadership model kind of starts here. I'm, uh, I'm playing with the, I can, now I've got my Apple Pencil going, I can join on the, uh, uh, I can draw on the iPad as well, which is um, probably going to infuriate everybody, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> so, you know, curation is about choosing your space. That's a social leader where we can be. Storytelling is, is the mechanism by which we're engaged in communities. And in the context of communities, we're often talking about co-created and crucially co-owned stories. So the ownership of the stories that are written in communities is very important. And sharing is about how do we um, add more signal than noise. This is an important principle of social leadership. Social leadership is not about the rules or about the, um, you know, adding noise into busy systems. They're about helping the system to find meaning. Uh, finding meaning in the system is particularly important. So today we'll explore community and then these next two stages here, reputation and social authority. For me, they're almost the most interesting part of social leadership. The reputation which is awarded to us by the community and how that leads into social authority and that's real power. So social authority is the power that sits outside the system. You're given your formal authority, you earn your social authority. And then these final um, three parts of the social leadership model, you know, how we co-create, um, how we co-create meaning, how we learn within uh, our communities. Social capital is ensuring that nobody is left behind. Um, and it's not just about uh, technology or understanding of that technology is about the etiquette of the spaces. Do we understand how recognition and reward flows through these spaces? And then, of course, at the end is 
collaboration. How do we um, collaborate effectively to drive change within these systems? So some of the uh, illustrations I'm pulling in here uh, come from the, uh, well, some are from the Social Leadership Handbook and some are from my first 100 days, which was the, the book I put out last year, exploring it. And, and sometimes on these webinars, I like to just explain the, uh, the sort of the origin of these uh, images. And uh, this one, I guess, is fairly obvious, but it, it was the idea that sense making in a community is about trying to put together the whole picture, uh, trying to put together the jigsaw, but when you don't have the box, it's the kind of jigsaw you got from the charity shop, which came in a plastic bag. So, you know, how do we do that? Well, you can do it yourself, um, but it's pretty hard. It's better uh, within uh, the community. So um, it's not just putting, it's not just putting together a known picture, it's figuring out what on earth the picture is. And this speaks to a, a broad uh, shift of the social age, which is that in, in the older world, we uh, probably looked at more codified um, knowledge. You know, somebody knew what was going on and it was down to the rest of us to find out what was going on. In, in the social age, we're probably increasingly have to fig having to figure that out together. We're having to, to figure out together what is actually happening within the, within the system. But this other part is particularly important. So what communities do if we um, build them correctly is they give us access to new types of voice. So I use that language quite carefully, you know, if we build them correctly. Well, it's easy to find voices that agree with the things that we say. Uh, it's easy to find voices which can frankly be intimidated into agreeing with the things we say, especially within an organisational or system-wide context, because voices of dissent um, invoke consequence, the consequence of the system. So if we look in healthcare systems, the voice of the whistleblower, who is arguably somebody who is trying to make the system better, is often um, sanctioned through social exclusion, um, harassment, bullying and such like. So where will I hear new voices is also about thinking what types of voices do I hear every day and how can I shift the lens to understand well what type of different voices are there. So voices of agreement, it's pretty easy to hear voices of agreement because they're permitted, they're tolerated and they don't invoke any kind of consequence either formal or social. But voices of dissent, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear some which are willing to stand in opposition to you but many of them are, are self-silenced, if you like. People, people hold themselves um, quiet. Voices of challenge, of course, are, are, are very important for us. And voices of perspective, the more perspective we have, the better we can uh, build a new type of strength. So in, in my more recent work around the socially dynamic organisation, we talk about diversified strength. So systems doing the thing they know how to do have a codified strength. But the type of strength we might need in the context of the social age is a diversified strength, uh, the strength to face up to challenges that we may not yet um, fully understand. I, uh, this is, uh, I guess, uh, I don't actually, I think it's my actually the first time I've shared this image outside of the book. Um, it's not really an image for presentation, but it's, it's one of the ones I sketched, which was the, this, really rather obvious thing, I guess, which is that um, professional isn't about the outward trappings of power. It's not about uh, whether you're sanctioned by the organization. It's not about whether you can fall. And, and of course, the, the, I guess the obvious mechanism of that is, is the, the notion of a, a suit makes you professional. Of course, it doesn't. It's, it's what's inside your head and the actions that you take that, um, that make you professional. We kind of all know this, but there's a notion of cultural grammar, which is something I find very interesting indeed. I, I did actually the early work on this um, and wrote the original article on this when I was working um, with a military group in, um, over in Washington, DC. And we were talking about, uh, I was talking with um, a woman who worked in that space and she was talking about how it was really hard for 
her to find her way in the space because she was neither uh, of a military background nor a man and much of the cultural grammar of those spaces uh, came from one of those two things um, you know it's kind of a man's world and it used a lot of shared language from um, from the military and we were talking about you know well, why is that you know why is it easy to put into some spaces but increasingly it's hard to get your head around and put into others and this notion of cultural grammar is to do with uh, it's not just language it's meaning which is shared within a group. So an understanding of the symbols of power, an understanding of where power is held, an understanding of consequence. Joining a community is very often about learning the cultural grammar of that space. The same as joining a new organization is about learning the cultural grammar of that space. So I thought I'd sort of put this in, cultural grammar is quite an um, important concept. There are some other, um, I guess this is still foundational stuff, really. The, uh, the squares that I'm using here, these kind of red squares, uh, draw off uh, some of the imagery I've used uh, quite extensively around the idea of a socially dynamic organisation. So normally I, I sort of fall to a cultural grammar, which represents the formal organisation with squares, so the social organisation with circles, so, you know, formal system of a square and individuals are circles. The, the formal system can give you formal power. Um, so that is codified power. If you are in charge of somebody, you can tell them what to do or you can ask them for help, but you do it with a backstop of formal authority. And in the context of the social age, your formal power is, isn't, isn't enough. And it's not that it's not good. I mean, a formal power is a great thing to have. It can frame your effectiveness. It can give you access to resource, it can give you an inherent permission, it can give you status in other formal communities, but it's not enough just to have formal power. Um, but funnily enough, it's not enough just to have social power either. So if you're high reputation, if you're held in the arms of your community, um, if you are able to make sense of what the community thinks and shape that story, that in itself may not be enough. And this speaks to one of the core effects of the social age. We will probably be effective in the space between the formal system and the social system. So we need fantastically strong formal systems. We need an ability to achieve effects at scale, to replicate, to be compliant, to be safe, which may be given to us best by a formal system. But we also need the co-creative ability, the questioning ability, the sense-making ability of the social system. So this is why I say, you know, social leadership is not an alternative to formal leadership. You need both. You know, we need to continue to build incredibly strong and effective, fair and kind and grounded formal leadership. But we also need to recognize, empower, build and unleash this social leadership and recognize that the two are not the same thing so somebody may have a great deal of formal authority and be a terrible social leader um, they, they may not act fairly in their community they may not be grounded in that space but similarly somebody may have uh, an incredible amount of social power and have no place in the formal system whatsoever they may derive their power in opposition to the formal system so ultimately we're, we're looking for both it's a, it's a tension between those two. What, you know, what does community give us? Well, oh, there go the firemen. That's what happens when you live opposite a fire station. They've got a new fire engine. They're very excited about it. They've been playing with it all day and all night. Um, yeah, they're off on their way. Everybody's all right. Um, what, what does community give us? Well, in some ways, one of the really important things that community gives us is, is momentum. You know, just plain and simple. It, it takes away some of your places to hide. And it gives you a certain shared momentum, individual impetus, you know, an impetus to action. This, of course, is why when people are trying to change habits, trying to give up smoking or trying to lose weight or trying to drive social change, they often come together within groups. Because 
groups do this uh, do these two things. Firstly, they help us to validate what we're looking for. So if we are fighting against animal testing and we come together in a community of other people who are fighting against animal testing, we kind of feel validated because other people agree with what we're trying to do. It's easier to gain momentum if you are in a community like that. But they also give us this incentive, which is uh, quite interesting. It's incentive, not of uh, financial reward. Formal systems often incentivize us with financial reward. Social systems incentivize us because they give us the opportunity to help others to be successful, to uh, share our knowledge, to share our um, learning. They give us an, an opportunity to enrich the social environment that we're part of. And it's quite interesting that when uh, I've looked into this, people often value um, the ability to help others, the ability to share knowledge, the ability to help others be successful. They value that more highly than their own success or their own financial reward. We are at heart quite social creatures. You know, we, um, we wish to be part of high functioning social communities. There's also um, another notion of community, which is uh, that it provides a helping hand. <laughs> and that's fairly obvious, you know, whatever we're trying to do, whether we're trying to build the system up or whether we're trying to tear the system down, if we're a member of a community, if we've earned the respect and engagement of the community, we have access to all of these different helping hands. And one of the things I wrote at the beginning of the first edition of the Social Leadership Handbook was um, to define uh, social leaders as people who engage in their communities without any expectation of reciprocity in the moment. So our nature of engagement as social leaders isn't transactional so we don't sort of say I will do this for you if you do this for me we say I will do this for you and once I've done it what else can I do how can I help you to be successful how can we help each other to be successful and we do that not in a naive belief but in an understanding of how social cohesion actually works that the balance at the end of the day isn't going to be weighing up a, a kilo of help versus a kilo of support. It's going to be weighing up how we helped each other function throughout the journey. So at times, I will be a net contributor to the culture of that community. And at times, I may be drawing upon the strength of that community. Um, but it's absolutely not in a, 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 recipro a, a reciprocal way in the moment. It's not transactional in that sense. So the investment we make in community to help others is, is, is rewarded by the help of others, um, sometimes when we think we need it and sometimes when others see that we need it. And that notion of how communities hold each other safe even beyond individual awareness is something that we look at later on as well when we come to think about social capital in, in social leadership. Um, the notion of uncertainty is, is quite important. Within formal systems, it's generally viewed as a, a weakness not to have an answer. So we come from a world where having knowledge gave you power and having certainty gave you momentum. And if we look at many of our systems today, that's still to a large extent the case. Uh, if somebody changes their view, um, or if they accept they don't know what's going on, it can be incredibly disempowering. I do some, uh, what I find fascinating work sometimes with groups looking at uh, using stories, looking at storytelling. And one of the um, storytelling approaches that I use is to gather stories of regret. So you ask people to share their stories of regret. And one of the most poignant of those, I remember I was in London with the NHS Leadership Academy. Um, a group from there, and one of the uh, guys there was a consultant. Uh, I think he, I think he was uh, in gerontology, and he described his story of regret like this. He said, "I um, I worked my way up through the system, and now he's kind of at the pinnacle of, 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 of his career, I guess. A great deal of formal power, and he does these ward rounds with the junior doctors, and he said they 
their job is to tell me what is wrong with the person in front of me. And my job is to tell them whether they're right or wrong. And his story of regret was the time when he was surrounded by young people telling him what they thought was wrong with the patient. And what he wanted to do was say to them, sometimes a patient is in front of us and it's, it's, it's uncurable, it's something we cannot do. It's not, I can't diagnose it, I, you know, I can't fix it. But he felt unable to share that story of uncertainty because it would erode his, his formal power. You know, he felt trapped in the system where he had to share knowledge and grade the knowledge that was shared with him. So he gave them an answer, even though he knew it was wrong. And I found it sort of fascinating that that had sort of lived with him for quite a time, was shared as his, his story of regret. So the ability to hold on to uncertainty and a willingness to share uncertainty is an individual behavior of social leaders, which is very important. In many formal systems, we lack the permission to do that. So one of the things we can do within social systems is grant people explicitly that permission to share uncertainty. Of course, much of what we do within our communities isn't to actively try to teach them anything. It's to be finely tuned into them. And uh, I remember I was explaining to my, I was trying to explain to my uh, nephew what static was which was, um, you know, if you've grown up, uh, if you've ever had, you know, my first television was one which had a dial and, you know, you, 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 you sort of turned the dial and the screen was covered in static and eventually you'd blunder across the signal and then you'd just fine tune it and you'd, you'd, you'd tune in through that static. And of course his experience is he's never seen static. He's never heard static because in a sort of digital world, you don't, you just don't have that static. And it really sort of struck me as uh, odd. It's um, the notion of sort of finding the signal is something that we're all conditioned into, but maybe today uh, we need a different grammar around it. But this notion that I was trying to, um, you might see that idea crop up in a blog tomorrow. I might write about that. But part of being a social leader is to listen to our it's not to feel we have to contribute or add value to them, but to listen and learn from them, to recognize um, that it's in, it's in the humble behavior of listening to conversations that we may find the greatest value. In fact, just as an aside, one of the things I'm working on at the moment, well, actually, I've stopped myself working on it. Uh, when I finish the Change Handbook, which uh, is coming along quite nicely, uh, the book after that is called The Humble Leader, and it's um, ex an exploration, a very short exploration of humility and social leadership. Uh, it's two and a half thousand words, and it'll be a, a sort of guided, reflective journey. Um, not a journey with answers, of course, because humility isn't about behavior so much as mindset. Uh, and I, I was just sort of reminded of it here, because it takes a certain humility of formal leaders to listen to conversations and not feel the need to to jump on them, you know, to add value by demonstrating their value, but rather to listen and to learn. So this work um, is something which, uh, the next couple of slides are, are one of the few parts of uh, my work on communities and social leadership, which have survived um, the transition from the first edition to the second edition of the social leadership book. And the reason for that is that my own view of uh, what communities are has changed quite significantly since 2014. So with great confidence when I wrote the first edition of the book, I, I said communities uh, ha uh, have shared value and shared purpose. That was the definition I used for a community. And now I think that's almost entirely wrong. Um, some communities have shared value and shared purpose. But through the work I've been doing uh, around types of power and social movements, I've come to realize that many communities um, find their power in opposition and dissent. So they don't come together 
to say these are the things that we agree on. They come together to say we are all united that we disagree with the things that are going on over there. Now, I realise that's not a great insight in some ways, because today we are surrounded by that in our political systems, in our media uh, systems. It's almost a dominant form of storytelling, is uh, stories of opposition and dissent. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure it always has been. I, I think that often the route to power historically was to start in opposition and move to consensus. When you gained formal power, you typically moved to consensus to get things done. Today, I think we're seeing systems remaining in opposition, even when they have formal power. Um, and that's quite interesting. But some of these slides I've kept. So this is a consideration of what is the purpose of the communities we belong to? Well, we belong to many different social communities. Some, of course, are communities of enlightenment. We go to communities of enlightenment to learn something. We don't necessarily feel that we will um, be adding much. One of the most important uh, is this sense-making community. Uh, sense-making is a core feature of communities in the social age, and it's directly the sense-making capability of our communities that give us power as social leaders. If we curate a number of different sense-making communities, if, we, if we're trapped within one group, we may only hear one set of opinions and views. So part of our responsibility as social leaders is to engage in different types of community. Some of these other um, areas I find interesting. Communities of subversion, I um, rather like at the moment. So, this is about sanctioned subversion, communities that challenge what organisations do, not to break them, not because they're bad people trying to break an organisation, they're good people that want it to be better, and they're gently subverting it from the inside. And that notion of the gentle subversion from the inside is one that I'm uh, using in the Change Handbook quite strongly. Individual agency, I call it there. You know, how do we empower the individual agency of every, every person? Um, communities of status are quite interesting. It's easy to sort of belittle them and say, well, it's just, it's, it's definitely not an act of humility to want to belong to a community of status. However, um, to be within a community of status maybe does give us the ability to have different types of thoughts, to achieve different types of effect. Um, one of the places I see this uh, working most uh, strongly within an organization is. Um, is when they have fellowship networks. So a fellowship network may be a community of status, but those fellowship networks are often very grounded within the organization. I, I spoke to a big technology company over in San Francisco just before Christmas, and they said when one of the fellows within their technology um, network gives a public, uh, runs a public session, uh, so a, a lunch lunch and learn session they generally get 200 times more people turning up than if one of the senior leaders uh, gives that session so communities of status can be ex you know extremely valuable extremely important um i'll just give you fair warning uh, there's a delivery turning up and i'm hoping somebody else is in the house to let them in but if not i might just have to run and open the door so uh, forgive me if that is the case um, the uh, so let me see amplification is the other um key thing communities of amplification uh sit behind social movement so the amplification of stories is is particularly valuable and uh, social amplification is remarkably poorly understood in fact um there's some interesting research out from Princeton and Duke in the US at the moment showing how uh, amplification is less a factor of the size of the community and actually relies quite heavily on these kind of dinosaurs that have enormous power within the system. So um, social media may not be quite as democratized in its power as we like to think it is, uh, but it, it's still pretty uncertain. Um, it's probably safe to say that. Social systems are radically complicated. They are, um, we, we like to think they're straightforward, uh, but they may not be. I think I may just need to go and deal with the door. So please excuse me for one uh, minute whilst I.
And this is the reality of being remote. <laughs> remote worker. It's all good. It's all sorted. Right. So I knew it was one of those things where they said we'll deliver it between 12 o'clock and 9 p.m. And of course, I knew they'd turn up the minute we got there. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's uh, jump back. I've made a mess of that slide. Let's look at the next one. Com community. Uh, well, this is, is uh, um, a bit more obvious, really. But it's always worth remembering that no matter um, how many communities we think that we are part of and we think that we can see around us, it's only ever a subset of, um, of the whole. Uh, formal and visible communities form only a small number of the communities that we're part of. And being open to that is kind of empowering. But it's also something we have to consciously remember. So we know from some, you know, there's plenty of really solid research that shows people consistently overestimate how many people they know within a social system. So if you work in an organisation with a thousand people, you'll consistently overestimate how many people you actually know within that system. And the other thing we tend to do is consistently overestimate how influential we are in the system. So we believe that we are more influential uh, than we really are. The other research I was looking at uh, recently, which is uh, a really groundbreaking piece of um, uh, social research, which was done in the 60s, was about how, um, how effective we think we are. There's an interesting act of self-delusion, which is that, um, and it, the, the original research was done with a group of drivers. Uh, and it was asking them to rate themselves as um, whether they were average or better than average. And nearly every driver rated themselves as better than average. And the interesting thing was that in the original study, the drivers that were being interviewed were all in hospital recovering from serious injuries caused by accidents they had, they had um, caused themselves. And yet they all rated themselves as better than average. And it's quite interesting because it turns out this is a broad sociological effect. We tend to believe that we are um, more effective than we are. So we think we're better connected, we think we're more influential, and we think we're better performed than we actually are. So, you know, maybe one thing communities can do is to keep us grounded. Now, um, relationships are important. Uh, when I drew this slide in the original Social Leadership Handbook, I hadn't done the piece of research that sat up here. But the Landscape of Trust research, um, which is the biggest research project in the world exploring trust, uh, looked exactly at this. You know, how are, what are the relationships that hold us together in communities? Well, contractual relationships are interesting, but it's only for a minority of people that these are important. So to give you a sense of that, in the prototype uh, survey in the Landscape of Trust project, out of 5,000 people, more than 75% of people said that um, bonds of trust are the strongest bonds in the community. For uh, under 25% contractual bonds were the primary uh, relationships that held them together. Bonds of faith are actually remarkably important as well. Imbued faith, projected faith, I believe that you will do the wrong thing. Um, is, a, is an important part of this. Uh, so the relationships that hold us together within communities are, are uh, particularly important, especially when you take into account some of the other results from that research. So 54% of people said they had low or no trust in the organisation that they worked for. So it turns out we, we exist in social communities bonded by by trust more than we exist in informal organisations held together by contractual bonds. Um, this is, uh, it's one of the illustrations from the 100 Days book, but I, I was thinking, I was trying to find the language really of, um, I was trying to develop the language I've used in the original uh, handbook where I talked about uh, three things social leaders do, one of which is to join communities and become sort of high functioning members. The second of which is to form and grow new communities. And the third is to, uh, is to leave communities. You know, is one of the things we should actively be doing is, is trying to leave a community. So I, I built out a series of uh, images in the book about how, 
action of community. And this, I'm, it's, it, I'm not really stuck with this analogy. I don't use, I don't generally talk about this much, but I threw it in here because it's the idea of nurturing and creating the conditions of creating the space where the community can emerge. And that I do use widely. In fact, it, that's what shaped the uh, conditions for community research um, running through the end of last year and into this year. What are the conditions that will allow the community to emerge and to thrive? And that's produced some really fascinating results. The, um, one of the most interesting for me was about technology. So the conditions for community research ran in the National Health Service in the UK and explored all sorts of factors. I think we explored uh, 16 different factors impacting on uh, communities. And one of them is about technology. Um, and it was asking which of the technologies that people use to collaborate within their communities on a daily basis. So the group identified 17 different technologies that they use on a daily basis for collaboration, 16 of which existed beyond the control of the organisation. Only one of those technologies was bought and paid for and owned by the NHS itself. So to be clear, the other 16 were technologies that people are explicitly not permitted to use to share clinical data to, to, to actually be effective. Um, and I thought it's quite fascinating. And of course, it's not unique to the National Health Service, where I've repeated that research in military contexts. I've typically found that um, that the number one places military groups collaborate is using WhatsApp, even though they're specifically forbidden from doing so. In financial services, the same, uh, the, exactly the same effect. And people do that because they own the parameters of that space. They own the consequence, they own the rules. It's a really fascinating effect. So, you know, as social leaders, what we, we have to, to seek to understand is uh, where our communities are and our formal communities are, are quite easy to, to find. You know, we have the, the, the office, uh, we have our universities and alumni groups, we have our, our social groups and, and so on and so forth. But where are our other communities? Well, of course, they're, they're all around us. Um, the, one of the developmental pathways for social leadership is to move beyond the communities we are part of into communities of opposition and dissent deliberately build an ability to engage in communities with whom we don't agree not to go and fight it out with them not to try to colonize those communities and convince them that we're right but to listen with humility and to understand the difference um, and i'm having some fun with that at the moment I, i'm actually quite looking forward to the next two weeks the weeks of the 18th and 25th of june um, I've dedicated to uh, building out the first certification around social leadership, which will be on storytelling. And one of the techniques that I'm building out on that is um, a technique called stories of difference, which is where you work with a group to write a story of their own disagreement and dissent. So to come together, to be able to say, these are the ways, the multitudinous ways where we disagree but through doing so, to find the parameters of our disagreement, where are the edges of our dissent? Because ultimately, you can create a, a space, you know, the things that you agree on around the, the edge of it and the things where we disagree in the middle. Interestingly, one of the roles of a social leader is not to drive consensus and conformity. It's actually to understand difference and dissent. Because the diversified strength of a socially dynamic organisation is to recognize the value in that difference, to recognize that the codified strength of an old organization is a weakness in the constant change of the social age. We still need some types of codified strength, but we crucially need the ability to figure things out, to understand the difference. In terms of other behaviors, the behavior of introduction, you know, a, a willingness to introduce people between communities. And I, I deliberately sort of use these different spaces. The interconnection of the socially dynamic organization is a willingness of people to, um, to make introductions between communities, to help the organization to become more interconnected. Because typically, um, no matter how well connected we think we are, 
as we grow our networks, we tend to grow them broadly within one subset of the whole organization. Uh, actually, I referenced this earlier, you know, three core uh, skills of the social leader to join communities, to leave communities and to build communities. One of the, the final ideas I wanted to share was this notion of um, ensuring that nobody is left voiceless. To understand uh, where permission comes from in social communities is also to understand how people can be left uh, disempowered and voiceless and I, there are some very obvious ways you know people lack access to technology if they fail to understand the rules which apply in a certain space these things can can leave you voiceless but there are some um, interesting ideas here about how systems tend to silence um, weak voices but the disruption and failure of systems is often precisely because they fail to take into account those weak voices. So one of the things we have to do is build a tolerance for ambiguity, is to build an ability to hold open um, a space where we don't have answers, where we don't have certainty, but where we encourage those who have no voice to find their voice, not to come in with answers, um, but to come in with their uncertainty or indeed to come in with their dissent. Now there are any number of ways that people can be uh, disenfranchised. One of the most interesting results from the research last year uh, was in the trust research where I explored 12 aspects of trust and when I asked people what they thought the most significant factors would be which impacted on trust um, the number one thing they thought was age. They thought age would have a significant impact. And the number two thing they thought was that technology would have a significant impact. Well, age has one of the weakest uh, effects on trust. It was one of the weakest of the 12 factors I looked at. The strongest uh, effect was actually gender, which was quite fascinating, that um, men and women used quantifiably different language to describe what trust means to them, how trust grows, and how trust fails. Um, ethnicity has an impact on trust, again, probably because of normalized internal views, cultural grammar specific to different groups. So people can be left voiceless for all sorts of different reasons. So this slide really is to share uh, a bit of a, a, a summary, a, a reflection um, about what social leaders do in uh, around communities. Well, sort of firstly and most obviously, our role is to hold a space open. So to create a space in which community uh, can emerge. And the two aspects that sit in tension here are that these new spaces are often held open with technology, but for community. And this is to, to refer back to what I talked about at the start, that technology may give us a space. It may give us the architecture um, that a community may choose to inhabit. But a community is far more than the space itself the community is about the bonds of trust that exist between us another in fact really one of the most interesting effects from the trust research was the uh, result that people trust formal technology about 30 percent less than they trust social technology when asked to rate it so broadly speaking when i referenced earlier that nhs result that people were collaborating with 16 unsanctioned technologies in preference to the one sanctioned technology. The reason that they seem to be doing that is not that the technology isn't good, it's just that they don't necessarily fully trust the ownership and control exerted by the organization in that formal space. So to be really clear, these are not bad people doing bad things. Generally speaking, these are good people trying to do exceptionally good things, but trying to do so 
in a consequence free space. So we hold open spaces with technology for communities to explore. You know, exploration is, is a key thing that we do in our communities. We explore different perspectives, different ideas. We rehearse, you know, the heart of social learning is the notion of rehearsal, that we can try new conversations out, we can try new behaviours out, we can prototype new skills. This is, is crucial for learning, the ability to, to try new things out. To share, to share not just ideas, as we talked about earlier, to share uncertainty, but increasingly within our social communities, to share our surplus, to share the, the, the spare thoughts we have, the resources we have, the access that we have, uh, to create new markets of sharing, um, which we only have access to through the ways that we engage in those communities. And of course, to innovate. Um, to innovate the approaches that we take, workflow, and of course, the very structure of the, of the organization itself. So that, um, that was really the journey I wanted to take us through looking at um, community and social leadership. I just thought I'd end up with the, the, the model here. Um, you know, I talked about, you know, as social leaders, we curate a space. We, we claim a space in which we will operate. We have the ability to claim so Our formal leadership is given to us, but we choose our space for social leadership. We become expert storytellers to understand the different types of story and the power that sits behind those stories. We share to add a signal, not just add noise into the system. And we do that within these multiple communities. This is why it's a, a sort of fairly pivotal point. And then with that in place, within our community, we build our reputation, we develop social authority. With all of that in place, we can co-create, you know, we can explore new ways of doing things. We can build and ensure that there is high social capital throughout communities. And we can be engaged in complex collaboration, not doing known things in known spaces, but facing unknown challenges in unknown spaces. So we've got a bit of time for questions. The, uh, the next webinar, which is coming up in July, we'll, we'll be looking at at reputation, um, but let me just check because I think there was there were some um, questions that I missed. Sorry, I didn't have my chat box open. So there's a couple of questions here. There's one, Rosie, you've got your question here. I'll just try to address that, and then we've got time for some other questions as well. Um, the participation, the role of the motivational leader. Well, I have to give you a slightly disingenuous answer to that. Within our communities. A leader can hold open a space, but anybody can be a leader. So um, I perhaps take a more nuanced view than you need one motivational leader leading from the front. The nature of leadership in, in the context of social leadership is highly contextual. So different people act as the leader at different times. I hope that answers that. Um, any other questions? Anybody have any thoughts or reflections that they'd like to uh, share or, or um, ideas that you, you want to share from your own practice? Very, uh, everyone's been very quiet today. <laughs> well, what I will do uh, after this, do chip in if you've got, if you've got questions. Um, I'll, I'll pull together a list of a few links and resources to, um, to send out. Um, remind you of a few things coming up. I've got the launch of the Trust Sketchbook in July, which I'm very excited about. Trust Sketchbook is, well, actually I'm excited. I'm more nervous about it than excited. It's, it's, um, it's a fully hand illustrated book, but it's only half complete. The Trust Sketchbook will, is built out of the landscape of trust research and it's a co-created journey. So you have to graffiti the book. You have to fill in the other half for yourself. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to getting that out there, but slightly nervous about how it goes. Will people get on with it or not? Um, 
So I'm having to feel comfortable with my own uncertainty around that. Uh, I think we've got, uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Issa. Thanks for uh, joining us again from uh, Mex Mexico. I, I don't know what time it is for you over there, but it's always great to see you there. In fact, a few familiar faces, I think, uh, as well. So, well, if we don't have any questions, I'll, I'll sort of draw us to a, a close there. Um, thanks for, uh, for joining and being part of this session. Um, if, you, if you don't have a copy of the Social Leadership Handbook or the 100 Days book, do drop me a, a note. I'll happily send you a, a copy out if you don't have that. If you're trying to make your own social leadership journey, then I can always link you in with one of the communities that are doing that. We have a number of open communities that are, are making those journeys. Um, do join us again for, for the next uh, webinar if you're able. And if you have questions, just, just uh, reach out at, at any time. But I'll hand over to Sam just to, just to uh, draw us to a close. Th thanks very much, guys. Yeah, re yeah, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, uh, both of you, for, for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thank you, Julian, and for everyone for attending today. Um, really good session. Thanks, Julian. Um, I am fortunate uh, to listen to quite a few of these, and every time I have a whole new perspective on it. So thank you. The next session, as Julian said, is at the beginning of July. It's the 3rd of July. Um, it's 2 p.m. UK time, and you can sign up in the same way as before. Uh, and if you need anything uh, in terms of the follow-up, in terms of a book, or you want to find out more about Julian or CSALT Learning, the details are on the screen there. You can get in touch with us on Twitter and we'll, we'll get straight back to you. Thank okay, you. On, on that note, I will hang up and hope to see many of you next time. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll definitely join again. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.